Hello and welcome to Mr. Clark After Dark, everyone. My name is Lucas Clark and I am a certified educator with Alberta Education and the Alberta Teachers Association. All conversations and interactions exchange is intended for educational and entertainment purposes only. In no way does the content discussed intend to be in violation of the ATA Code of Conduct or meant to target any individual student, teacher, or to belittle or demean the profession in any way. If you have something that you would like me to discuss or have a story of your own to share, please reach out at lucasrdclark97 at gmail.com. You can also send a direct message to me on Instagram at Mr. Clark After Dark. Hope you enjoy the show and please do not forget to subscribe. And now on to the show. Hope you all enjoy. Hello again, friends, and welcome back to another episode. Today I have on the one and only Chris Organ. Chris is currently a principal who is in his 15th year in the profession. On part one of the podcast here today, Chris and I discuss what inspired him to be a teacher while working as a leader at an ADHD summer camp, how our influence as teachers expand beyond what we may typically think, what he looks for when interviewing teachers, the importance of showing growth, not being a yeller, approaching administration as a head teacher coach rather than a boss, the unwritten curriculum and what your university education does not teach you, toning down your reactivity in the classroom, his experience teaching in Lac La Biche in his first year, establishing boundaries with students, being a better listener, giving quality formative feedback, and much more. Thank you guys all for listening and hope you all enjoy the show. Thanks. You know, that's the first question I ask anybody in an interview. Yeah. Why be a teacher? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the thing is that you you can have a love for subjects. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So I loved history. Yeah. Asking why you become a teacher. Same. I don't know why that seems to be a common thread <laughs> with a I lot of teachers. It feels but... kind of hard right now with the uh, doomed to repeat a kind of scenario. Yeah. People aren't reading enough history. But yeah. the um, a love of a subject is not always enough to be a teacher. Yeah. It all starts with a desire to help kids mm-hmm. um, and everything else from that will be, will be, uh, will be sugar because the thing is with teaching, there are going to be a lot of great days yeah, and there are going to be a lot of hard days, usually way more good days than bad days, mm-hmm. but it's a lot of work. And if you just love, let's say history, yeah. then it's not the job for you. Go down the library, read some books, and be happy with your history love. <laughs> um, but if you really want to help children mm-hmm. and understand, help them grow and develop, then that's the job for you. I didn't want to be a teacher at first. Mm-hmm. So what did you want to do and like what changed? Uh, I was going to do commerce. Yeah. In fact, I was in commerce. Uh, first of all, I did philosophy for a year at King's University in Halifax. Philosophy? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know what to do at first. Um, my whole family are teachers. Well, not my whole family. I'd say I have about probably 20, 14, 15 people in my family who are teachers, whether it's my mother, uh, yeah. uncles, yeah. aunts, cousins. And I was kind of a stickler for, I'm going to do my own thing. So I avoided teaching, the path of teaching, although I coached yeah. sports as a kid, yeah. worked with youth. I was like, but I'm not going to be a teacher. And then I had this gentleman named Dave Stock uh, who ran a uh, camp called Camp Kodiak. And I was working retail and mm-hmm. I was a key strep on campus and all this kind of stuff. But it was kind of like unfulfilling. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. So but wait, was Camp Kodiak? Is this like uh, a sports camp? Kodiak, camp? No, Camp Kodiak is a camp for special needs children. Okay. Well, not special needs entirely. It's it's mostly ADHD children. Mm-hmm. Um, said head, some head trauma. So car crashes. Okay. Um, perhaps car crashes. Other accidents happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but really what it was, was it's a seven week camp, four or th- four or three or seven altogether. For kids from across the world to go to work uh, on their social skills, their life skills, mm-hmm. um, and build their confidence up. So I used to sail back in Halifax, mm-hmm. and I was in running through campus one day, and I was thinking of working in a retail store or, you know, all kind of stuff, and I like being outdoors. Yep. And there was a gentleman there saying, you know, we're looking for people to work in Ontario, teaching sailing. I'm like, I can do that. So summer outdoors seemed like a pretty good deal. And then after, you know, the first summer, 
But week six, I realized I'm going to be a teacher because we had a lot of people leave that summer at the okay. camp because they didn't – They a lot of people project what they think kids should be like, right? When kids really are what they are, mm -hmm. we can guide them and we can steer them in the right direction. Um, but an example is you're not going to get upset for an ODD kid for being defiant. You know, how he's defiant or she's defiant, maybe. Mm -hmm. But being defiant, that's there's no point in that. It's like being upset at the rain for being wet. <laughs> the rain's wet. The kid has ODD. The kid's going to be defiant. So people came to the camp expecting, you know, not knowing what ADHD was or these head trauma cases um, or special needs of different levels, cognitive delays. Yeah. I thought, well, they're just, this should be really just, this just figure it out. I didn't have that perspective yeah. of, as another podcast I was on before, was uh, I have ADHD. Mm -hmm. And so I had a little more experience there. And I realized after about the fifth week, it being such a tough job, quote unquote, that I was loving it. And I had this moment where I was sitting down with a dock, with a sail dock. So I'm like, oh, son of a gun. Yeah. I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> and then, and the, the family was right. <laughs> the family was right. Um, so I went back, changed my major. So I could have teachables. Yeah. Because commerce doesn't really have any teachables. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I went down the teaching path, which my whole family was like, of course you're going to be a teacher. We yeah. always knew you are going to be a teacher. But yeah. the more they told me as a kid... Or suggested more. I put my heels in. Yeah, because you're like, you're. I want to make my own. Well, you still made your own decision. Yeah, you still came to it on your own accord. Like, oh, it was going to be sailing. Once mm -hmm. you kind of realized it was, I can literally teach something I just enjoy doing. That yeah. becomes it makes it feel like less like work. Kind of. Yeah, and you know, there's days where work is work. Um, yeah. but there's days where, you know, if you love your work, you're pretty blessed. You're pretty fortunate. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so I guess the question is, why teach? Love of kids. Love of families, and you got to have hope in the future. And I teach because I have hope in the future of our kids. Yeah. Um, my kids are beautiful at my school; they're fantastic. You know, they they have their ups and their downs, like all kids do. Mm -hmm. But every one of my kids is kind in the soul. And I think if they're not kind, it's because they had other environmental issues go in there, or it's the fact that we as adults teach them not to be kind. So, what do you mean by that? Um, I think that if you're, you know, out in the if you're any adult is a role model, mm -hmm. right? So if you're a teacher in a classroom, for example, and you, you're you at your end, you're burnt out, it's been a rough day, you know, we'd always, there's always something in the background that makes your job a little harder, right? Your own personal life. People aren't just teachers. They have a personal life and their yeah. teaching life. Um, but if you're a yeller, what are you modeling for your kids, right? You're not kind. And they've now learned to be unkind. If I start to belittle my son, you know, who goes to the school here, who both my boys do. My other son realizes if I were to do that, it's okay to belittle him. We don't have to explicitly teach hate, but it's you can demonstrate yeah. you can demonstrate what hate looks like. Now if I have a comment about any group that is unfavorable, my kids will pick up and think that's actually what I believe and they'll start to think the same thing. So kids are not born to be kids are born kind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I walk into any ECDP class, you know, three-year-olds, three-and-a-half-year-olds. Um, there's no ego about them. They're not worried about the clothes they wear. They're not really worried about who their friends are. They just want to play. Mm -hmm. And they're play-based learning or whatever. They're just kind. There's more hugs in that classroom to each other than you'll see everywhere else. And so, yeah, I believe that, you know, we have great power as teachers. It was like Spider-Man. <laughs> you know, big power comes with your responsibility. <laughs> But you do have a big responsibility because you're teaching, helping kids develop with cooperation with the parents. Um, but you're also modeling uh, what it means to be kind and caring and be service-based. Well, yeah. I mean, you're spending, for a high school, I guess, example, you're spending 130 hours with 100 people. Mm -hmm. and so if you don't think that kind of influence that you have and how you respond to things influences how they potentially respond to things, you're just wrong. Like, mm -hmm. like, you do have a bigger influence than you think. Um, before the interview, do you have anything that you can kind of share at all about like what you look for in an interview that's different than obviously like I have my education degree, I did education. Mm -hmm. What are some, because I know there's always the main questions, and but yeah. what is kind of the external factors you kind of are looking for maybe to kind of prop up? Well, that first question why I teach is always, you know, mm -hmm. that I ask um, is always, it's a fair weather marker, I guess. So what's that? A fair weather marker is going to tell me which okay. way it's going to go. Okay. You know, All right. um, if you say I teach because I want to teach because I got an art street and know what to do, 
or I got a science degree <laughs> to know what to do, or I got a math degree to know what to do. Yeah. I'm like, oh boy, you know. Yeah. Um, you're gonna have to work yourself back from that. And how often does thing. that happen? You think? Uh, I'd say one out of five interviews I do, I guess I'm like that. One out of like, five. Okay. I wasn't sure what to do, so I decided to be a teacher. I'm like, okay, well, mm-hmm. you know, and you might be an excellent teacher. Yes. Um, but I wouldn't put that as your reason for teaching. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, looking at an interview, the first thing I look for is that why teach, but B, have you shown growth? You can give me a teacher in my first year. Are you, are you familiar with the growth mindset? Yeah. Okay. You can give me a teacher in the first year who's excellent, but stagnant. They haven't shown improvement, have no desire for improvement. They've got their first year stuff down. They're a great first year teacher. Mm-hmm. Then you give me somebody who, let's say, is struggling their first year. But, in, you know, September, like, oh, my God, my classroom is a disaster. I can't get the classroom managed down. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's too much work to do. I, I, okay, we talk them through. We coach them through. That's our job as administrator, right, to coach people through. And by December, they've made, you know, great progress. They're not the greatest teacher yet because mm-hmm. nobody can be the greatest teacher in the first year. I'm sorry. It's a mm-hmm. long career. Mm-hmm. It's a profession. It's not a... It's, it's not a gig. It's not a gig. Yeah. Exactly. And so if you give me that person in their first year of teaching who has grown every, you know, is always looking to grow. So maybe by December, they're still a bit late in their assignments or their due dates, which is, you know, it's annoying, but whatever. Mm-hmm. But they've really got their class of management locked in now. Great. And then by February, they really started to get the paperwork stuff because a lot of unwritten curriculum will be in a first-year teacher. Right? A lot of what, sorry? Unwritten curriculum. Unwritten, okay. What Things do you mean by teaching that? teaching your BED. So, for example, BED mostly includes items such as, well, your... Your curriculum instruction, yep, right. That's uh, it's a given. Like your core subjects, your core stuff. subject yep. instruction. You know, you're going to do a little bit on, uh, probably on equity. I would hope in your BED. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to do some work on, uh, maybe your elementary phonics numeracy in general. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to do things maybe on maybe I did a course on middle school. Uh, this, is, this is 20 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> on middle school uh, instruction and classroom culture. Mm-hmm. They don't teach you in your BED is how to balance all the things that you experience as a first year teacher or as a teacher in general, they do not teach how to teach. So for example, IPPs, yeah. every school division in the province and the country has an IPP or an IEP. Those who don't know an individual program plan, which is for kids who have differing needs or individual education plan. Every province has them for every around the, mm-hmm. around the country. So they don't teach you how to do those properly, right? And that was an interesting part because in my BED, just a few years ago, I had a spring course and there was, it was like, I think it was inclusive learning mm-hmm. and it was a three week course because it was a spring. Short. Uh, yeah, it was, it was very short and it was kind of my expectation that that would be where I would learn kind of how to differentiate and maybe do the IPPs because, I mean, I did sub for two years. Mm-hmm. I, I will say I had like, arguably the best education because one, I was doing my full degree online while subbing here every day. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of learning both sides as I was going in terms of, I guess like maybe the best opportunity to be more involved as I could. Mm -hmm. Um, But I found it was, and again, it was mostly like promoting inclusive inclusivity in your classroom, like ways to do that. But it was never really, here's the, concrete day-to-day documents that you actually deal with to try to enact yeah. that right and it, it really document you get it down it's pretty it's not a problem at all all you have to do is you know learn the document but then it's actually how to implement it right and then that's just one example so you have ipps you have your paperwork such as report cards everybody goes report cards are that's fine yeah. how to use your grade book uh progress reports uh how to make parent contacts uh classroom managers if you may not understand uh how to do proper formative assessment, all these mm-hmm. things. Oh, and you have your supervision schedules, you have your yep. PTIs, yep. all these things that as you become a more experienced teacher, become nat- part of the natural rhythm and flow. Yes. But in your first year of teaching, it's like whoosh. It's drinking from a fire hose. So the natural rhythm and the flow, how long did that kind of take you to get there? Because I'm noticing like I'm a little bit more comfortable with the ARC this year because I'm yeah, teaching the same courses. But and you're more comfortable because even if you're not teaching the same courses, the unwritten curriculum you now are familiar with. Mm-hmm. You know the rhythm of the school. So, okay, September's going to be really busy because I'm getting used to my kids. Yeah. I'm figuring out what their needs yeah. are. <clears throat> I've read their IPPs. I'm updating their IPPs. Oh, I remember I have to call these parents here. Mm-hmm. You've had that rhythm, right? 
even if your first term, you got a term of rhythm in you, yeah. right? So second term is like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, what are my principal's expectations or report cards? You know, all those kind of things. You got that by now. Um, it takes you about, it took me, my first year was in Lac Labiche teaching. Um, it was a good experience to have. Uh, we decided to come to Fort McMurray. I had family up here. Okay. And so we decided to come to Fort Mac. Um, that's 2005. I would say three years where okay. I didn't have to think about the rhythm too much. It was just kind of how your life was. Yeah, like yeah. I, it's, it's how you become into the interject into the school. Mm -hmm. It was my first year at Beacon Hill School when I got used to the rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I knew report cards were coming up in my first and second year, third year. You know, that was, that's automatic. Um, but I always stress out about it. <laughs> right? And then my fourth year, I'm like, okay, yeah, so I have these. I know how to do my grade book. Now I know how to get my grade book in here so I don't have to panic. So I'm not saving all my marking for the week before. Mm -hmm. This is before we had standards in the pro in the district, like assess every month. I had assessments. Mm -hmm. They were my paper book. <laughs> back, you know, you had back your teacher manual, you had your, you had your grade book yeah. back then. And then the day before, you'd be like, oh, I'll calculate the marks, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you get used to that and you get to, okay, so I'm going to assess, mark, and input and figure it out as we go along. Stuff like that. You know, it took about three years till you feel a little more comfortable. But there's no day that's the same. You know, you could be thinking you got a, a, the second you think you have teaching unlocked, <laughs> someone's going to come to the door. That's a dangerous. Uh... <laughs> that's going to come and bite you. Yeah. Right. So. So what do you mean by that? Like having it unlocked and it comes to bite you? Like, cause there's... So let's say there's a lot of factors that affect teaching. So let's say, yeah. you know, I teach, I used to teach grade eight here. So I'm doing grade eight science and we're doing our light unit and we're doing those chem boxes where you have a candle and the flips reverse uh, the image upside down we're talking about yeah, light yeah. and its yeah. properties um great you're all prepared right well kids have needs you know say a kid comes in here had a bad day and knocks over your stuff oh son of a gun right? <laughs> the whole lesson's ruined you were so proud of it and you yeah. gotta remember to take yourself out of the situation where it's the kid's not personally upset at you there's something else going on right there's those kind of things so, did, uh, was that kind of like an automatic thing for you learning to Remove yourself from the behavior you receive. It is not automatic. Yeah. I have to work hard on that. I still work hard on that. Mm -hmm. If I get a phone call that I'm not really thrilled to receive sometimes, like I, I get to consciously breathe and stop and remember, no matter what my personal feelings are, I'm the principal of Greeley Road School or I'm a teacher of McTavish or I'm a whatever. So I you kind of have like a mental tool kind of yeah. built in of like, Mm -hmm. When I feel like I'm reacting to something, I got to remember it's mm -hmm. it's my reactivity that I need to kind of yeah, nip in the bud. Yeah, there's times I mess right? up. Pardon? There's times you mess up. Yes, I mess of up course. still. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's. I mean, let's be honest. Like, you know, a kid, I'm like, I'm not going to be like, oh, well, that's a big deal. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, geez, right? That's a simple <laughs> thing. You know, or it could be that you're all set for your plans and you're da, da, da. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> there's no fault of anybody's. There's a massive influx of students in their grade. And guess what? You're you're Switching this course out for this course out because that's what we have the need for. Yeah. Well, oh my goodness. Now I've spent all this like August getting ready for a course. Now it's a new course. And yeah. you know, how do they do this to me? And it's just like yeah. it's just a situation. <laughs> um, it could be new government requirements, you know, on, on teaching that you weren't ready for. The, so there's always going to be something that comes in. Mm -hmm. Nothing is ever the same. Ever. You can control your circle of influence, you know, how you prepare your your demeanor with your kids, building relationships, parental communication, mm -hmm. right? And all those things. But there's factors you can't control. And that's really important for teachers to know, especially new teachers, mm -hmm. that we're dealing with living human beings. They are bright. They are smart. They have quirks. We have quirks. <laughs> things are going to go a little astray sometimes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no. Sorry, I think I lost the question there. Sorry. Um, oh, that's all right. I'm trying to think. So how... What is the initial move to Lac La Biche like and what is kind of your first year? Like how would you kind of reframing yourself, how would you have prepared for that now? I think that my first year, my first year teaching was probably my worst year teaching. Okay. And not because of the students or the environment because I was not prepared. Well, and so even kind of going back to your point where you just said like no first year teacher can ever be because you have all that to kind of figure mm -hmm. out. So why would you say it's your like worst? Um, I became a yeller. Okay. Yeah. Um, that first year, never did it again. I mean, I, I'm sure there's some kids out there who's like, well, he yelled me once. Yeah, I did. But it was, it became my go-to because I had terrible classroom management. I tried to go in my first year because I was 23 years old and I'm the new young teacher. So obviously I'm going to be cool. I thought, 
right? And for the first <laughs> month, it was awesome, right? I'm the yeah. cool young teacher. Yeah. Uh, this is back in the day. I'm not cool anymore. I'm a yeah. dad. I'm a father with two kids. And you you're, know, you're pretty cool. <laughs> you know, so all that kind of stuff. The Christmas sweater was pretty cool. Actually. Yeah, no, that was fun. <laughs> Tic Tac Toe sweater was awesome. But yeah, no, yeah. I try to be cool and get the kids to like me. Um, I did not learn the difference between their friend and being their friendly teacher. Mm -hmm. There's wow, a big okay. difference. And so I didn't have many classroom strategy moments. I walked in thinking that kids are going to respect me because I'm the teacher. Kids should respect you because you're the teacher. Kids are, especially in a community where kids have lots of turnover, yeah. they're probably looking at you going, so uh, what's your deal? Yeah. You know? <laughs> are you going to last with us or whatever? Yeah. And so I coached the sports. I made great relationships there. It was a lot of fun. But I also, to be frank, did not expect the workload that I was to be. Because you do your practicum, mm -hmm. let's be real, you go to your practicum, yeah. you instruct the easy win. Your first practice, maybe you just observe. And the second one, you... Yeah. Maybe you teach an hour a day. And mm -hmm. you're back when I was at Acadia, it was the yeah. third one was, okay, you're teaching you half time. And the fourth one is your last one. And that's when you're teaching full time. But you're teaching full time. So you think you're teaching full time, but you're not teaching full time. <laughs> because who has the parent contacts? Who does the reporting? Yeah. Who does the grading? Yeah. Who does the staff meetings? Who goes to the uh, PTIs? Yeah, okay, you might go to the PTIs, but the parents don't even know who you are. They're looking at the teacher. Yes. Yeah. So all those things I wasn't prepared for. And so... Uh, I think by third week of September, I thought I was going to drown in the workload. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wasn't prioritizing. I was having fun. It was my first year out mm -hmm. of the house. I was 23 years old. Or not the house. I went to university. But like, yeah. you know. First year on your own, you're making money. Yeah, yeah I'm making money. I made five bucks an hour before that. <laughs> right? Or five fifty, whatever minimum wage back was in Nova Scotia. Yeah. Um, you know, so I had my first car. Yep. At my first own place, mm -hmm. I was 3,000, or geez, 5,000 kilometers from home mm -hmm. back in uh, Nova Scotia. I was like, sweet. You know, I have money. Let's go have fun. Yep. Um, I didn't know the workload. I didn't adjust for the workload. It's like, when did you kind of realize? Was there like a moment that you can kind of recall that where you were like, I need to, like, it what did probably, you change? It's probably. By November, I had lost my class completely. Okay. So what do you mean by that? Uh, you know, yelling, sit down, da, 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 talking yeah. back, all this stuff. My lessons were boring as heck. Because what I did was I took whatever the previous teacher did and said, this is what we do here. It was all worksheets and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? And I was like, well, of course they're not, you know. And I relied on me being the young teacher. Oh, yeah. And again, every first year teacher almost like should, really. Like it, it takes yeah. a long time to kind of craft your own material. Because, but... you know, I coach the sports and all this stuff. But, but then... um. But by the end of the year, you know, I was starting to get him back, but it was so much work. And how do you get him back? It's easier to put structure in place. And by structure, I don't mean being strict. You know, there's a big so difference. So what's that balance like for you? So structure for me is here are our classroom routines. You know, if then statements. If this happens, we're going to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Just like that. Don't raise your voice. Mm -hmm. You're going to shut these kids off. When If I yelled at you, what happens to your cortex? <laughs> Frazzled. <laughs> yeah, you go to fight or flight. Yeah. Right? Are you actually able to listen to me? Yeah. Right? And listen anyway, like after that even. Yeah. Because you're and going then, to be ruminating a little bit. Right. And I've ruined our relationship. Yeah. Right? So what happened was I didn't have a structure in place. So kids had absolute, not absolute freedom, but I just expected them to just be, just be good kids. Yeah. Um, and it was way harder to put the structures in place after I didn't have any. Whereas if you put structures in place in the beginning and as kids get more responsible in your classroom, you can start to pull things away if you want to, that's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So kids before like, you were the cool guy, what's going on now? Well, you weren't learning, <laughs> yeah. right? And you were talking back and you're showing my class late and it took about probably November, June, I would say April. Wow. That long to get the class back. And I didn't get the class back fully. I had damaged some relationships, not by being mean, but by, you know, you're not fair. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Well, because um, you, you, because I guess the, the students never expect the teacher to change. Mm -hmm. Like, and so they resist to that change. Yep. Yeah, and, right. and I had a wonderful teacher next door, Dennis Tier. Okay. He taught for years at that school. I think he was like the, uh, like the foundation. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful man. He had taught, I think, when I spoke to him, he had, at this point, was teaching the grandchildren of some people in the community who he taught the yeah. grandparents, the parents, and the grandchildren. Yeah. And I didn't get him. 
because he was very, you know, very, <laughs> you know, very strict. Coached all the sports. Kids loved him, but I didn't get how he. He was like, da, 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 da. Yeah. Like, I perceived him to be that way. Mm-hmm. Was so amazing with the kids. He provides them. I wasn't providing. He was providing a safe learning environment that was caring and it was structured and calm. And I wasn't That's doing the goal. that. Caring, yeah. structured, and calm. Yeah, and yeah. I wasn't doing that. And so he pulled me aside. You know, when, a, when you're a first-year teacher and somebody's yeah. been teaching for 29, 30 years, pulls you aside and says, hey, do you want to, do you want to talk? Want to have a, have a coffee? It's almost like a shangri I'm like, oh, yes. yes. <laughs> you want to hug them, grab their ankle, <laughs> and pray for the God to help you and save you, right? Yeah. He, was, he was awesome with that. Mm-hmm. And he, he was very frank. And he goes, I've seen it before. You know, these kids are great. They will push your limits. Just here's what we, we you, you, I'm not telling you what to do, he said, but here's what works for me. And I'm like, at that point, I'm like, teach me. Yes. Teach me. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and then at the end of the year, you know, things didn't work out. And, you know, I'll be honest, I was let go. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was deservedly let go. Uh, now they, my principal loved me. So we had something called a division principal back then, which I was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And he would come by and do two observations a year. So he's did my observations. He decided at that point I should be let go. The principal at the time down there, Gary Robb, he fought for me to stay, but it was out of his hands because he saw growth. Mm-hmm. That's what he was impressed by growth. Yeah. But I had family in Fort McMurray. Uh, my uncle and aunt taught here since the eighties, early eighties. Yep. Yeah. In the Catholic board, and they said, "Come on up, you know, we'll give you a well. Here's a Catholic board number, uh, and just in case it doesn't work out with the Catholic board, here's a public school number." <laughs> well, I put my resume in that night, yeah. and the public board called me the next day, I, and I went up on a Thursday. No, it was me. It was a long weekend. I went up Thursday night, interview Friday, hired Friday. It was that fast, and Catholic Board called me on set on Monday. I'm like already hired. Yeah, didn't really matter to me. I just got a job, and I came to Green Road School my first year. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. I didn't know it was like a full circle. Yeah, it thing is a full circle there. thing. So my first year okay. Green Road School, and I had some amazing, amazing people there who, who uh, helped me with the structure, you know. And mm-hmm. also, I I'd, I had been stung once. I wasn't going to be stung again. And so, because I guess that kind of goes back to, and again, just not to like give any criticism, but do you think it's in the position that you're in now to let that first year teacher go? Like, I know this is you in this context of like, who's let being let go. go. Like how? Well, cause you said, you said that you were let go. Oh like yeah. That's what you said. So, I mean, look, cause I guess from my perspective, it would be okay. Even though I'd only did two observations as like your kind of division principal, like there was growth. Cause you even yeah, said by so, April, you were starting to get them back. So you're still seeing some sort of a change. Yeah, so, like, so back in Lac La Biche, my teach, my principal never did my evaluations. He would always come in and visit. It was different okay. back then. Okay. The person from division office do my evaluation. They would come from Bonneville. Okay. I didn't even know them in Black Labish, really. Yeah. Um, and you went, based on what he saw, I would let myself go too. Um, okay. But as a principal in your schools, we recommend to the school division about hiring. Mm-hmm. Here's what's going to make me wonder about giving you a contract or not in your first year. A, are you coachable? Mm-hmm. Basically, do you have a growth mindset? Yeah. B, do you try your best to be kind to the kids? There might be moments where you snap. And by snapping, I mean, I'm not talking about like, you know, hitting or cursing. Those yes. things are absolutely yes. no's, yeah. not yeah. happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's say you say, you know, you yell, you know, hey, kids, quiet down. Or yeah. like, why are you guys doing this? Those moments happen. Yeah. We don't like them to happen, but they happen. But do you have the kids' best interest at heart? And do you love working with kids? Now, you know, those three things were pretty good. And you think about all the things that covers. Well, first of all, if you're um, growth mindset, you're going to improve upon your classroom instruction. You're going to improve, improve upon your deadlines. You're going to make stronger report cards, better assessment tools. We can work with you. We as a division can bring you up, right? If I have somebody walk in and best intentions, wonderful references, let's say, yeah. you know, they're the next great all-star of all teaching. Mm-hmm. And they come in, they already know it all. They're not listening to their peer teachers yeah. for advice. Um, maybe they, you know, blame the kids for everything that goes wrong. That's a dangerous thing. Yes. Right? Um, maybe it's always somebody else's fault or, you know, whatever. Those are things that in your first year, I'm like, okay, 
I think it's time we let you go. Because you're not giving me your best. I don't mean your best work. That's not going to come yet. Yeah. If you're not giving me your best effort in your first year when you're under evaluation, yeah. that makes you worry for the future. Yeah. What's going to happen if you have a permanent contract? Yeah. So if I think it's an absolute no, I will recommend to division that person not be hired. Mm-hmm. By their second year, Oh, sorry. So that that's the first part. Yeah. But if I'm not sure yet, mm-hmm. and I think that they have potential for growth, then I'll may offer them a second year continu- a second year probationary, mm-hmm. or say, I think you're going the right direction. I'm not sure yet, so mm-hmm. we're going to give you a second probationary. So what would kind of be? Yeah, I don't like. I don't want to get into any examples for that. But what is kind of that line of continue? Because I almost find. Obviously, I feel very extremely fortunate to have mm-hmm. a continuing contract in mm-hmm. my second year. But like, what is the line between giving someone that continuing and the second? I guess you kind of touched on it there where you're kind of seeing like, what are the, I guess when you're doing evaluations, what are things that you look at as like a primary concern? Because we know the first year is kind of that mm-hmm. growth and you're trying to grow. But what are kind of the, what's kind of the main indicators you look for in an evaluation? Uh, besides the TQS qualities, we yes. have to get the evaluate yeah, besides yeah. that one. Yeah. But it's kind of the unwritten and, part. And, and, kind and, of and remember, the, now yeah. your, your, your decision to hire somebody is not based upon the sole evaluations, mm-hmm. right? I mean, let's say for some weird miracle, you go in to observe twice mm-hmm. and you have, you know, your formal evaluations, right? And it's a rock star classroom. But you're there every day because this has gone wrong, that's gone wrong. You drop in for okay. value, you drop in to say hi, and the kids aren't listening at all, or their marks are always late. So it's not just the evaluate formal evaluation mm-hmm. that determines it. It's the whole picture. But you have to have as administrator, you have to have documentation as to what your concerns are, and you better communicate to the teacher because it's not fair to them mm-hmm. not to know what they have to grow on. So an example of what would give me a uh, would be a decision between a first uh, letting somebody go in their first year or a second year continuation. Let's say that the person in their TQS is, has hit like three of them. They're, 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 they have maybe a few they're really weak on, but they're growing. Mm-hmm. That's second year because okay. they're growing, mm-hmm. right? That's the second year. Condi- I'm not able to give them the full contract because I'm not sure they have all the bases I need, Okay, but they're growing in those areas. Okay, another year. That's good. Let's figure this out. Right. But you still have some areas of concern before you just kind of but slap the permit. Yeah, but okay. they showed me a growth mindset, mm-hmm. a desire to improve. That's a, I have no problem with that. So what does growth mindset mean to you? Like, And how do you still kind of channel it? Uh, growth mindset, what it means to me, is simply a matter of continuous improvement. You know, if you don't have a growth mindset, you're going to lose. What are you teaching for? Yeah. You know, um, I used to hate when I was a kid, you know, um, in elementary school, mm-hmm. you know, kids were labeled, still are labeled sometimes. But like, yeah. when I was in junior high, grade seven, at my other schools, you'd have the advanced class and the average class or yeah. whatever, right? And it's grade seven. Yeah. So now you're basically <laughs> telling the kids in the middle class that you are not ever going to be up yes. in that advanced class in grade seven. That stalls a growth mindset. Yeah, well, because you almost, like, you internalize that. Yep, Like, you it's do. not... I'm not one of the smart kids. <clears throat> well, and so, like, I always tell the kids, I literally graduated social 30-2 with a 62. Mm-hmm. And then I literally, I upgraded the next semester because I was like, okay, now I want to actually go to university to pursue mid-80s and dash one, mm-hmm. the next semester. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, it's never, like, you never put that dash two limit on yourself. Because yeah. I find, I hate, and even some, like, I'll hear chatter, just people saying, like, oh... Like, it's just like a dash two kid. I'm like, no, like, that's no, just not the attitude to have. You can't label kids that way. No. Because you're, you're, st- you're putting, you're the gatekeeper in a way. Yeah, like you're. And you're, and you're putting limits on the children's potential. Yeah. So growth mindset means to me continuous improvement and the potential for improvement and the desire to want to improve. And I think showing a desire to improve is yeah. a big one too. You know, but following through the desire, you can tell me yeah. one thing and then, you know, oh, I'm going to do, I'll, I'll do, I'll get better. I'll get better. And I come in like a week later and I look at your classroom, it's the exact same thing all over again. We sit down and talk, so what happened? And if I find out that you try stuff but it didn't work, A okay. Yeah. Some things don't work, we'll work it. Maybe you say, Oh, I didn't get around to trying it. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, we have to talk deeper to that because that's an issue. Yes. Um and so do you guess, find, do you ever have an issue having those like hard conversations? Was that like a skill that you learned to develop? Because I used to be terrible at it. <laughs> I used, I I I uh I won't name names. Yeah. But when I was younger and early in my VP roles, mm-hmm. that's when you have really have the hard conversations. Yeah. 
I remember a couple times I had conversations, and I apologize to these people later on in my career because I reflected, um, where I said, why can't you do this, this, this? It's not that hard. To do. And I used to be like, well, if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. Which was a big bonehead move, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't yeah. being a coach then. Yeah. I was being a boss. I was very young yeah, as an administrator. Yeah, yeah. I was 28 when I became an administrator the first time. Um, so I was insecure. I didn't have a coach mentality. Like kind of like an imposter feeling? An imposter, or, 100%. Yeah. That's a real thing. Yeah. Um, but then as I had some great mentors, George Decker would be one of them. Mm -hmm. I passed away. I had Scott Barr here, Anna Lee. Yeah. Actually, everybody in division office I worked with pretty much okay, at yeah. some point in my career. Um, you see the patience that I wasn't demonstrating, right? Okay. And the ability to listen. So now to have those fierce conversations, I always start off with the following things. Are you okay? Right. Just like a kid comes in with baggage, staff members have baggage too. Yeah. Right. Are you okay? Do you feel supported? How's everything going? Because they might come to you and say, you know, let's say I have somebody with an issue with, uh, I don't know, let's say poor parental communication. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I can come at them and say, because I got a baby, a parent call me complaining about how they never hear from the teacher, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, the teacher called and said, your kid is terrible. Which has never happened in that yeah. way, but yeah. So I go down there and say, "What are you doing?" You know, you don't talk yeah. to teachers that parents that way. Like, geez, Murphy, right? Yeah. Or if I say, you know, after all of my qualification statements, are you okay? And then I can do. Yeah. And if I get to the, you know, how you do it, and then what are your successes? Great. Uh, what, what are your successes? successes? Yeah. And what are your so what's going well right now? And they tell me. What's kind of hard? And they might say often, they'll always say to me something like, they'll get to the point before I break it up with them. And they will say, yeah, you know what? I really messed up the other day with this parent on a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I didn't mean for it to happen, but I don't know how to approach it. And I find the parent maybe intimidating and this and yeah. that. All right, we can work together on it, right? So it's like, you might have those kids. I know administrators in the division talking about this. We will sit there in our office. Because listening is a skill I got to work on. It, as I'm talking a lot right now. Yeah. But listening is a skill I really have to work on. I continue to work on. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Active listening. All the staff members come to my office sometimes. Really stressed out. Go, can we talk? And they come in. They sit down. We close the door respectfully. Yeah. And they go, I have this problem, this problem, this problem. We talk about all we do. They talk themselves into their solution. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, oh, I, I got this kid who's not doing this and I try this, but I could try this and I could try that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what? I think, I think this is going to work. <laughs> all right. And they leave my office. They feel great. And they say, thanks for all your help. I'm like, I'm kind of confused. I'm like, I'm glad I could help. I leave. I said, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> um, so the fierce conversations back to your original point, are they difficult? Yes, they're difficult. There's times you have to have them. Yeah. Um, but nobody should ever be surprised that a fierce conversation is coming. Yeah. I should not, let's say, Lucas, you're my teacher. Yeah. Uh, let's say that you're in my school. Lucas, I've really known that you, I've, I've seen you with your uh, interaction with the kids. Mm -hmm. They are not exactly, I'm making this up. Yes. Yeah. Right. For everyone who's listening, I'm yeah, making yeah. this up. Yeah. Let's Park. say, <laughs> hypothetical, that uh, I don't like how you talk to students in a way that is too aggressive and you're not really great at listening to them. Yeah. I'm not going to bring you into my office right away. And say, okay, Lucas, I've had it. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. And that's not how I approach a fierce conversation anyway. Mm -hmm. I might say, you know, in the hallway, kids are getting in the class. Hey, Lucas, are you okay? How's it going? Like you don't right. wait till it gets to stage five. You, yeah. You, you kind of see stage two, stage three, and you're like, okay, I'm starting Get to see early. something building here. You, yeah. We don't want to have teachers go into a classroom and it's not a sink or swim situation. No administrator wants that mm -hmm. ever. And we get a lot of stuff on our plates, so it's hard to be in the classrooms all the time. Yeah. But nobody wants that. We want to coach you up, mm -hmm. right? Because let's be, be real. Finding teachers is hard. Yeah. And then keeping good teachers is difficult. Mm -hmm. And so we want to coach you and bring you up there. So, but the fierce conversation happens after I've talked to you once or twice, right? And talked with you and listened to you. Um, I said, hey, you know, this thing, oh, it's still an issue. Let's talk with them. And I say, okay, uh, you know, let's have a meeting. I want to discuss a little further. Yeah. And my fierce conversation might be something like, you know, so we had this conversation before. I know it's hard and I get that it's challenging. Yeah. But this is a requirement in our school of how we treat children. Yeah. And how we communicate with each other. So this is now a directive, which is when a person gives you a directive, it is you must do. Yeah. The difference between may and shall, right? Yeah. You may do this, that's just like, well, if you want to, you shall is a directive. Yeah. Now, you will 
And how mm. often do you get to that directive point? Is ah, it- geez, Louise. You might get a directive point. I've been... A, I've been... That's kind of like a last resort, almost. Or no, is it? It's not a last resort because yeah. then actually the contract... And we never get to... Yes. I've never been to this yeah. point. You have the verbal, the written, and then you have like a actual... You know, like you have to have to talk about your future employment. Okay. It's never, for me, gone past the fierce conversation point. Um... Mostly, and when it has, I'm not going to talk about it. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, but like, maybe once in my five years, four years of being a man as a principal, and for that, I was VP for roughly eight years. Maybe once, just go there. Okay. Because most people, and you got it, and this is what people have to realize: no teacher who's employed wants to be a bad teacher. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nobody goes in and says, I want to be a yeller or I really want to be disorganized yeah. or I want to have the same paper worksheets every day just so I can be boring the kids to death. <laughs> right? People like my like teachers to, were boring. I want to be more boring. Right. So most people have the, the desire to improve. Yeah. And the problem is, is that sometimes we are afraid to bring it up or we have an issue with conflict. Conflict, people think, is something that is a negative. Conflict does not have to be a negative. And people think conflict is fighting back and forth and yelling and screaming. Yeah. No, it could be two different opinions or different views. Mm-hmm. You know, so you have a teacher who's paper based all the time. Kids are acting up. Well, behavior is a communication, right? They don't know what to do. Yeah. You talk to them and you say, you know, how about you try? And we show them like there's a book called Beyond Monet or even like back in the day it was UBD. Try it actually like this. See how it goes, right? They'll try it. They don't want to be stuck in their ways. Nobody has ever come to me or think any principal and say, well, I like handouts. I'm doing handouts and this well, is what we're going to do. And that's the main question I pretty much ask most people because I find teaching social studies, you're so maybe ingrained is the wrong word, but literally in university, it's lecture. That is yeah. it. Like when you do, when you study history or political science, well, that's like obviously my two disciplines, mm-hmm. but every single class was lecture. Like we had a seminar in each major or whatever, but finding ways to spice it up, like new yep. activities, different things to get kids moving. That's like the biggest challenge that I've tried. But again, I'm still trying to grow, I guess. Yeah, right? but, you, but you're, you, sometimes you teach the way you've been taught. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A BED program yeah. back East is a year, 16 months, maybe two years, depending yeah. on the program structure. Um, well, you've been in school since you were in kindergarten to grade 12. So what you have is... The institutional biography. Yeah, yeah. 13 yeah. years of how you were taught. Yeah. And then two years of how you should teach, maybe. Yes. And then trying to undo all the 13 years before is kind of hard. If you want to undo it, you may have an excellent teacher before that. So, and also in a college class, what do you have? All the kids who've shown them, proven themselves to be strong learners. Yeah. Who have had, who are now supposedly independent enough to learn. Yeah, because you're like a professional learner. Right. Like you're not point. really a teacher yet. Like that's no. the that was a hard transition. That is hard. And the instructors but. don't have to have BEDs either. They're not professors are not trained yeah. on the best pedagogical approaches. Yeah. They're experts in their field delivering that message to you. Yeah. You know, you can't expect, you know, in a social studies class to have lecture all day and have kids go, This is absolutely wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> you know? Because you have a whole bunch of different The Tuesday things. at eight AM, I can't wait to hear them talk. So for what, an what, hour. what what do you teach right now? <laughs> social 30, 10, and 20. Yeah. Okay, so give me something that, like, what is the most boring unit you teach out of all that? The most boring the unit. The one you I hate teach? the most? Uh, I would say. I don't know. I love them all. <laughs> I would okay. say maybe. I would say right now the most surprisingly dry one is probably unit three for grade 12. And what's that topic? That's because honestly, this is my favorite topic. Uh-huh. And I found it's been the hardest for me to land with my students uh-huh. is going over the cold war and then like Canadian institutions. Mm -hmm. And so you actually do like a a Canada U S kind of institution comparison of looking at like parliamentary democracy versus Republic and all that stuff. But the kids just hate it. But like when you, when you're getting into Canadian government and U S cold war politics, like that is my jam. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, that's the one unit I can't stick yet. I don't know why. Have you really stuck with the kids that they love? Well, it's always the same ultra nationalism and twenty one. 
because you get into the nitty gritty of the Holocaust and mm. the gulags and you get into all these different genocides and that's like the most, the and stuff they, that sticks. And you look around the world right now and they see yes. the rise of nationalism. Yes. The reason why the first one is a little more challenging probably is the kids haven't found relevance to their personal lives yes. right now. Yeah. The second one's probably really interesting for those kids because they can go home. They watch CBC or BBC. Well, like or, you're going to find... Like my son, yeah. grade 11, gets his news on Snapchat, which we had a big talk about last yeah. night. <laughs> I'm like, buddy... Where's the editorial process here? You know, what's the yeah. betting? But, you know, so, I mean, they're looking at that and they go, okay, I can relate to this, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Um, the Cold War to them is something that they don't live every day yet. Yeah. I hope it never to live again. Yeah. So it's hard to relate. So that's the challenge you have in that unit is getting to relate to it. Yeah. And so you talk about, you know, so you talk, my, my, one of my courses I took at university way back when was Canadian American Relations. Right. Yeah. I did a whole thesis on NAFTA back then yeah. before it got changed into whatever it is now. Yeah. Um, did I like it? Heck yeah, because I'm. Yeah. But you know, it's hard for younger ones. So that's the challenge: is going to get those kids to engage. Have you asked them why they're bored? No. I ask them. Yeah. Because well, and so I guess because one of the things, like one of the tools, I guess that I learned in my social studies class was trying to embed a through line question that has some sort of modern current or like current relevancy. So an essential so, question? Yeah. And so yeah. usually the main question I always try to address throughout was in what way have our conceptualizations of freedom changed over time? So sure. you kind of, you look at everything from the perspective of freedom, what it is, how it changes. So you'll mm -hmm. go from classical to modern liberalism. And I find like pretty much the center changes. We used to want freedom from government. And then our mm -hmm. idea was we need government to provide security. Mm -hmm. That was our change of it was freedom from government versus freedom from um, like market exploitation. Mm -hmm. Like that was kind of the shift there that I always try to address. And and I'll be honest, still being in the beginning of like my year two, I guess, mm -hmm. um, my grade 12 courses have always been the top priority because yeah. they're going toward their diploma. And I found over the last six months, it's been OK. How do I beef up my 10 and 20 classes? Here's the so, thing. Beef up your 10 and 20 classes. You will focus on grade 12s always. Yeah. All the kids will have equal focus. Yeah. But if you really start to dig into grade 10 and 11 in your yeah. social studies, mm -hmm. you're going to instill the work habits you expect. Yes. By the time they get to grade 12. And I guess maybe I'm I, when I'm referring to beefing up the content. So I yeah. say it would, um, for the most part, like over the last... I think at the end of October, we're going to get start getting into ultranationalism with my mm -hmm. grade 11s. And over the summer, I'm going to comb back through it again here over the next few weeks. Um, I read the book Bloodlands oh, yeah. by Timothy Snyder. Mm -hmm. And it was literally just the annihilation of Poland between mm -hmm. Hitler and Stalin. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like an unexpected twist that I... I didn't actually know the initial plan for the final solution mm -hmm. was to send all the Jewish people from Europe to Madagascar. Yeah, had no there's, idea. There's so it's like of... little things like that that you find, like those are little nuggets that they'll always be like, that did not see that coming at so all. But... You said some things that actually made me quite happy with your future is teaching. Okay. <laughs> uh, the first thing is you've given to thought to the future. You're not stuck in the right now, right now, right now mm -hmm. instruction. B, you've reflected on where you want to go. So those two things there tell me you're going to have, you know, from what I know of you. Well, it's fun. You'll have, yeah, it is fun. <laughs> yeah. um, but... The key is to not expect all kids to be enthralled with your lecture. No. And there's a big difference between, well, I have to make everything entertaining. No, you don't. Yeah. But you have to do your darndest to make everything relevant. But I, and I, and yeah, yeah, 100%. And I almost find realistically, I think the third unit is probably the one that doesn't land. It's because it's also done in either May to beginning of June or mm. December to January where people end are just semester. exhausted. It's end of semester. People are just trying to get it through. So I can, and maybe even it's end of semester. So I'm a little bit more worn down. You know what I mean? So maybe I don't have the same level of energy that I'm putting into it yeah. as I did. But I did find like this semester, I have 30-1 first block. Whereas before I had a fourth block. Mm -hmm. So my energy going in is night and day almost yeah. in terms of the um, what I have to kind of give mm -hmm. at block four. And like one of my main questions I always ask is how do you kind of maintain that same level of teaching energy for every block? Cause that is a bit of a challenge. Cause like, no matter how much you love it, like you just get naturally it's a tired. Huge challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. can I ask some weird questions? Absolutely. Yes. Weird. Go for weird. it. Okay. So what time you go to bed? I, <laughs> 
maybe nine, nine thirty. Okay, great. yeah, like I go to bed pretty early. Yeah. I'm a pretty old. So you man. have a sleep down. That's yeah. the huge part. That's a yeah. part that if you don't yeah. take care of yourself, you can't take care of the kids, right? Yeah. That's the other part. Um, so you have four classes yep. in a day. Are any of them repeats? Like, you teach the same thing twice? Third and fourth block are repeats. Yeah. Third and fourth block are repeats. That's grade 11? 11, yeah, 20 one. So, Owen's class. I think yeah. it's my second. It's block four. So, yeah. block three and four. Okay. Yeah. So, the joy there is in your third class. I used to teach science here years ago. Yeah. And the best part was, not the best part, uh, blessing and a curse. You taught, I taught the same thing three times in a day. All right? Yeah. Same lesson. And what got me going for the third and fourth class was okay. First class, you know, the third, first of that class. Yep. It's like, oh, hope it works. Yes. Right. <laughs> Second class, you're immediately reflecting. What can I change? What am I going to change for the yes. next lesson? Right. Yep. That kind of thing. But it really comes down to relationships. You're going to be tired. Yeah. The kids are tired too. Yes. Yeah. Right? That's the thing. Like, you're, it kind of sucks because it's not like you're getting the worst of each other, but you're getting the most. Like you're getting the last part, yeah, of, the it's the last part of the day. Like we all know it's an hour and a half till the day's done. Yeah. So you're trying to like, but still maintain that vigor in a sense. But teach the way that you wish you were taught. Yeah. And chances are kids in that class, you know, you talk to them too while they're engaged. Yeah. Most of them will be excited to learn the way that you were taught. You were probably not excited to learn about lectures. Yeah. Right? What did excite you when you were students? Yeah. Whatever that is, yeah. try to bring that into the class. Or maybe it was a teacher yeah. who was super engaged maybe it was you know we had some really current event issues we talked about and i had my voice was heard yeah whatever it might be try to bring that in there because you're in control you're, the curriculum is set yeah right that's not in your control mm -hmm. but how you teach is in your control yeah and that is the beauty of being a teacher you can help you get to you have some control in your of your classroom which yeah. is how you want to teach but also you get to teach in a fun manner if you want yeah. to. My first couple of years teaching, I was, uh, so you said third year was when I got my groove. Mm -hmm. uh, before, I, after my, my first year at school, I started a classroom management down, which mm -hmm. was wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I think I'm starting to yeah, like kind get of get it a little bit. And I think like it has gotten better still because I'm, I'm learning to find the balance of friend to friendly teacher. Mm -hmm. I think I'm starting to see that and like seeing how I'm even changing and how I interact mm -hmm. with everyone. But yeah, I continue. Yeah, no, because you are, you are the professional, right? Yeah. Um, I was the, you know, you're still surviving your second year. Yeah. So I was, okay, we're going to do our math unit on, uh, what was it, grade seven? So I'm doing the uh, basic algebra, right? So turn to page 52. We're going to instruct, I'll do question three and four with you on the board. You're going to do question five and six. I'll be circling it around. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Same pattern almost every day. Yes. Right? I wasn't having fun. Yeah. The kids weren't having fun. And it's not about having fun, but the kids were not engaged. Yes. They were doing it because they were respectful and they were doing it. Yeah. And then Anna Lee brought something in. We right know what this was called backwards design, generally speaking. Yeah, yeah. Instructional design. That was new back then. Mm -hmm. And so performance-based tasks, right? So why are we learning what we're learning? What is the authentic task at the end? And how are we going to get there? So then all of a sudden, I had kids learning the exact same thing. We were being much more hands-on. Their marks were improving. I was happier because the kids were engaged. So what kind of changes did you make? Less worksheets. Okay. Um, authentic tasks were things such, oh, a lot more summative feedback, formative feedback. Formative feedback. Okay. That's a big thing. Yeah. When I was growing up, it was like, here's your mark. Boom. Here's your mark. Boom. Here's your yeah. mark. Boom. Right. And I'd um, say, and I would say I'm still almost there. Like what you're saying, because whenever you even mention something is formative it's an immediate okay i don't want to do this yeah no, so okay. that is hard so how did you kind of so here's how you do it in, in english yeah. class yeah so uh grade nines they still write stories i believe don't they for the pats i think so Not or an sure. essay english is, i, I avoid like grade, plague <laughs> okay let's take a grade six for example okay yeah. grade six is have to write a short story and a newspaper article for their pat okay um narrative writing we teach it throughout the year if I give the kid a rubric, great. We went over the rubric. Absolutely phenomenal, right? Yep. Boom. I give the kid the first short story of the year or the term. He writes it back. He gets a 60. Mm -hmm. Or in our school, you know, grades one to four. But let's, just for people listening, a 60%. Okay. Great. The kid got a 60. And then we do more lessons in class. And we come back to short story writing again. And the kid comes back again. And the kid got a, I don't know, a 65, yep. right? Still There's improvement there. Meanwhile, you've just given back the marks. The kid for the 
term three, we do a little bit of a short story or a newspaper article, same writing basics, you know, six plus one writing traits or whatever you're using. And the king comes back with the 70. All right, kids made improvement. Yay. The kids gain improvement because your classroom instruction, hopefully, and maybe he's more fluent at, or she is more fluent at writing. Wonderful. How much better would it have been if in the first term you gave the kid the rough draft, right? You, tell, you did all your lessons on what it means to do write a narrative, let's do a newspaper article. Yeah. And you, know, you did inverted triangle and stuff on yeah. what it means to write a news article that's effective. Okay. The kid has the rough draft. The kid's not sure how it does. I am not marking that as summative, right? What I'm going to do is give that back to the kid with my formative comments and then meet with that. Sh now, I know this is difficult. Yeah. All the other teachers are going to say, yeah, but. They have the yeah, buts. But I have that. I have like 30 yeah. kids. I know. Yeah. Right? You do, you know, another writing assignment or you do uh, silent reading. It's great as an elementary, okay? Yeah. Or maybe one day uh, you, you plan in. So let's say I'm doing a news article mm -hmm. unit. Maybe that day I show them a documentary on the BBC and how they report yeah. or PBS. Because yeah. those are two, those are two BBC and PBS. Yeah. Those are two ones that are very dry. Yes. But it's what we teach kids how to write news articles in terms of like the actual facts. Yeah. You know, we're not trying to teach them cable news. Yes. Right? We're yeah. having sensationalized. Yeah. So we, they watch documentary now, me and the kids only for five minutes. Here's what you did well. Here's what you have to work on. Here are your goals for the next draft. All right. Even if a kid has a 50, or has twos, not fours. Yeah. They're like, all right, I can get better. Yeah. I can do better. Not labeling with the summit of grade that they use slap on right. and be like, this is what kind of student you are. And right. then they come back and they make those improvements. And now the now that I've walked through every single kid in the second draft, it's peer evaluation. I've already modeled for them how to do some formative feedback. Yeah. And I tell them. So your question was, how do you get the kids to actually give a hoot about the formative assessment? Yeah. Well, you have two choices, kids. We can work together to bring your mark up, or you can give me a rough draft three times, basically, where you don't give a hoot and you get the rough draft mark. Hey everyone, thank you all for tuning in. Really do appreciate it. Just wanted to say again, if there are any issues with professional conduct and or you would like to share your own story, experience, or have someone you would like to contribute to the show, please do not hesitate to reach out at lucasrdclark97 at gmail.com or send a direct message on Instagram to at Mr. Clark After Dark. Hope you all enjoyed, potentially found something of use. And of course, please do not forget to subscribe. See you guys all next time, unless you're scared.